Hi, I'm Weird Al Yankovic, and you're listening to the Pantheon Network. Hey, I'm Nick DiMatteo, and welcome to Season 5, Episode 39 of Music is Not a Genre, MXG. I was prepped for the hand gestures that time. Thank you, as always, for watching and listening. Please remember to support this podcast at patreon.com slash music is not a genre. Full stop. I'm going to pause here for a second so that you can go to that site and try it out for free for a week. You don't know what Patreon is, do you? If you're not on there, you don't. It's a great way to support people who make things, artists, creators, and this is something that is desperately needed by all of us. But if you're watching and listening to this, then I'm pitching for myself here because I really need your support there. It's getting increasingly hard for me to fit in the time I need to do all of the research and pre-recording and recording and post-production and graphics and all of that writing and all of that that I do on a weekly basis. And now that I've decided to bring this to you almost 52 weeks out of the year, uh, it, it's, again, getting that much harder to keep that schedule up. And in order to do that, I really, really need your support. And I love that Patreon lets you try it out for free now, which I think is a wonderful thing. Once you're on there for a week, five bucks a month is all you would really need to spend. If you can spare more, that's awesome. But even that little bit, you'd be surprised what a huge, huge difference it makes. So please go to patreon.com slash music is not a genre. And then after you do that, go to youtube.com slash at music is not a genre. Subscribe there. Always free, of course. It's YouTube, you know, unless you don't like ads and you pay for it. You know, that's something I've been debating lately. And at youtube.com slash at music is not a genre. If you're just a listener, you get to see all the videos, all of the videos for free, as well as videos of live music, recorded music, so many other things that I share there. Please subscribe and like and ding the bell or whatever they tell you to do over at YouTube. And then, of course, my site is nickdematio.com, where I've just done a bunch of upgrades. It's so incredibly easy to navigate, so slick, so smooth, and it has everything there. The podcast, the music, the voiceovers, the acting, the graphic design, the blog, so much else. A way to contact me, and when you do, you're automatically signed up to my uh, free, let's say, trice monthly newsletter. I don't know. And I would love to have you there because you get to learn a little bit more and have a direct connection with me. And then as always, please listen to and support my band, Rec, at recarea.bandcamp.com. Rec is spelled R-E-C. And all of these links are below, as well as a link to my t-shirts, the official t-shirts for Rec and MXG. You can get there on my site, nickdomadio.com, or just click the link below. And if you use the code SUMMER2320, 2320, SUMMER2320, you get 20% off through the summer, any t-shirts that you buy. So please consider all of those things. And thank you for bearing with me for that important PSA. Let's get to the topic. It's a pretty exciting week because this week I'm starting a new series. I feel like I say that a lot lately, but that's, uh, you know, it's because I love series and I'm very excited about this. And it's a series on albums and I'm calling it, What's an Album and Why? Part one, history in the 1950s. So the way this is going to go is like this. And let me take one second to swallow. There. I did it. I did it audibly so that people not watching had some fun there. And the way I'm going to do this is because, uh, you know, albums have a rich history uh, of almost a century. And depending on how you define an album, even longer than that. So I'm going to start this week by focusing on uh, what an album is, the history of it, why it's an album. Uh, I'm not going to go as in-depth as maybe I did on another episode where I did actually discuss, uh, I think, formats, and I talked about where albums came from and all of that. But I will give you enough of a history to help you understand where we're coming from here and why an album exists and why it's important, why it's significant as a work of art in its own right, aside from just a collection of songs. And then I'm going to jump right into the first full decade when 33 and a third albums existed, and that was the 1950s, and give you my favorites, some notable albums, what developments happened in that decade, and then throughout the series, I will do decade by decade. 
and do the same thing. Without the history, of course, I'm going to go into favorite albums of the 60s, notable albums, what happened to the album in the 60s, how it developed, and then 70s, 80s, 90s, and on until I reach the, the last decade, let's say, and, and then see where the series goes from there. But welcome to the first part of the series, and let's get right to it. So a little history about albums. And like I said, I've done a history before. Some of what I say here, I didn't say in the other episode, so kind of good, but it's still going to be relatively brief. Uh, but prior to the 33 and a third RPM revolutions per minute, for those of you who don't know, that's how fast the disc spins to play the music with you know, on a turntable with the needle and all that stuff. And I'm saying all this because I don't know that you know that. It's, that's not, it's not a common thing anymore. It's a retro thing now. But it's not that common. Prior to 33 and a third, the standard was 78 revolutions per minute. And so if it's going faster, it can naturally hold less music. And a 78, uh, let's say a 12 inch, and there were 10 inch, 12 inch, there were you know smaller discs, could hold at most five minutes per side. And so back when you had artists or record companies more likely, who wanted to le- release more than one song at a time, or let's say it was a classical piece and you and you had movements and pieces of that and you certainly couldn't fit it on five minutes on one side or t- at, t- at most 10 minutes on two sides, you collected three or four discs, put them together and bound them up as a unit in a, in a box or whatever that very closely resembled a photo album. So here I have in my diorama, for those of you just listening, I've got three things here and I'm going to go with the bottom one first. And that is this here. This is just a standard photo album, right? You know, faux leather, whatever you want to call it. It's probably vinyl, honestly, uh, ironically. And inside it's got the sheets and in this case, photos. This is very much what albums look like before the advent of the, you know, 33 and a third, when you could fit, you know, eight or more songs on two sides of one disc, everything was a box set. I think when I talked about box sets, I talked about this in, in the box set episode. And, and there's, you know, good reason for that. The max for an average 78 RPM collection, uh, which was an album, which it got its name from resembling a photo. I'll put it in, you know, a book, basically, and pull out the discs, the graphic that I have on both the uh, audio and video version of this podcast, you'll see two uh, examples of record albums, and you see how much they look like photo albums. And then there's a, an old record player there that I put there as well. And so that's really where the name album comes from. But at most, it would hold six or eight songs. And what's funny is, you think of that as, ah, it's ridiculous. And you go that far back in time and you can't believe that that's where it started. But where did we go when CDs came? Eventually, we had these things, which, I mean, doesn't this look a lot like an album as well? For those of you just listening, again, I'm holding up a, a vinyl, a, a CD case that can hold like a hundred and some CDs or whatever. And I've got uh, like soundtracks and Christmas and and stuff like that in here because I'm trying to, you know, save shelf space these days. And this one has a zipper, of course, you know, and and that's eerily similar to what old uh, albums look like when in the age of the 78 RPM. And that all started in Europe, Britain, a couple of other countries around 1910, very early 20th century, is when they started saying, hey, we can collect some of this artist's songs or this, you know, this orchestra's, you know, playing of the uh, symphony or whatever it is into one big compendium and call it an album and sell it like that. It didn't trickle over into the U.S. until the 1920s. And, and again, most of these were classical, especially in, in the beginning, but, but then you did have other artists who were putting out single songs, short songs. Uh, I'll talk, and I'll say this now, one, I've, I had a, an episode many uh, seasons ago that talked about how technology drives development in music. Uh, 
and vice versa. But that things we take for granted now happen because of technology. And perfect example here is that cylinders, which were prior to 78 RPMs and then 78 RPMs, could hold two, three, four minutes of music, five minutes at most. And so that became the standard for how long a song should be. You know, it had to fit on one side. That's just the way it had to go. And we take for granted that that's kind of now human attention span, you know, leader and things that Schumann did and all that, that that was a factor as well. But and then that may have actually helped to drive the technology and what the length of that technology was. So it was sort of a chicken egg thing. But I do believe that the length of a single was very much dictated by the limitations of the technology. And even though it, it morphed, we still kind of consider a single a song is somewhere between two and five minutes usually. And there's certainly been longer ones and shorter ones, but that's kind of the average is three to four minutes. So you had uh, record companies collecting these into, in, into that, and they, they would market them as albums. Now, there were earlier attempts to use new technology, the 33 and the third RPM, to market them as LPs, actually in the 1920s and 1930s by the Edison Company and RCA Victor and I think a few others. Those attempts were unsuccessful. The technology was ahead of its time, I guess, or maybe it was too expensive. I'm not exactly sure why. And it didn't really start to take off and become a permanent thing, at least by the, those standards, in, in, until 1948 when Columbia Records reintroduced the 33 and a third RPM and a company that large had the push to really market it and make it work. And that was pretty much all classical music, you know, and at the time in the, in the late forties, when this started, most recordings were, had at least dual releases. One would be 78 RPM box set, the album. And then one would be the 33 and a third version of that, which at the time the dominant was 10 inch and not 12 inch. Uh, and so 10 inch could only hold about six songs, let's say, whereas, or no, I'm sorry, eight songs, whereas the 12 inch could hold a little bit more. And, and we'll, I'll talk about how that developed through the early 50s and, and beyond. And so you have this pretty standard length of time for both songs and albums or collections that stem from 78 right into the 33 and a third. It didn't completely take off in 48, but it started there. And so and I'll talk about some significant releases in 48 and 49 before getting into the 50s. By the early 50s, there was still a large percentage of uh, sales for 78 RPM. It wasn't until the late 50s where that trickled down to maybe 2%. And uh, 33 and a third and 45s took over. And I'm not even going to talk about 60s and what happened there because that's not part of this episode. That'll be the next one. It's a series. And so the the 10-inch could hold, I, I'm not sure, what was it, maybe 35 minutes of music, something like that. Let's just say that. Uh, the 12-inch could hold around 45 minutes of music. And that's why, again, technology driving you know music, the kind of mean length of an album has held fairly steady at 45 minutes, even when CDs gave us the ability to have an hour or more of music or streaming, it doesn't even matter how long an album is these days, people still tend to do albums that are generally somewhere above, to, let's say 25 minutes and generally somewhere below 90, 70, let's say even below 75 minutes. And if you hit the, the mean in there, somewhere in the middle is around 45. It just it just makes sense, right? Uh, and so, yeah, and I talked about the singles. I'm just looking at my notes. So why am I starting in the 50s, let's say, or the late 40s and not sooner? Because I'm considering the album prior to that was not considered an art form. It was just considered a collection collection of 78 RPM discs, or, you know, and even in the beginning, the 33 and a third was just considered, oh, we can put the full collection on two sides now instead of, you know, eight sides or, or six sides. And that means that people started con to consider, well, how do you craft an album? And through the 50s, that would develop into quite an art in itself. And that's, that's why I'm starting 
here. And to give a kind of an overview of where I'm going with this, I'm talking a little bit about albums that were in the late 40s, very late 40s. I'll go through all of the 50s today. And then in the next series episode, and this is going to extend into season six, it just will. Because I'm not going to do them back to back. You know, I don't do that. I'll talk about the 60s and how the 60s and 70s is really where the album had its heyday as an art form, as a consideration of, again, how do all these songs go together to form a whole, which really harkens back to the classical era. You know, how do you do like a three movement symphony or, or sonata or what have you, concerto and all of that? How do those pieces fit together? And how do the, the, the sections of each of those pieces fit together to form a cohesive whole? So it's not a new concept, but it was sort of reintroduced into the vernacular and the world of popular music by the 50s and had its blow up in the 60s and 70s, started to wane a little in the 80s and 90s, but still pretty strong. And when I get there, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, some awesome albums, you know, as works of art, you know, in the 80s and 90s. And it wasn't really until the late 90s and into the 2000s where you see a steep decline in people considering the album as an art form. And that's, of course, MP3 streaming and all of that stuff. But then in the 2010s, you know, it started to make a comeback. And a lot of artists, I just did an interview with a guy who has his own podcast, Jesse Jackson, not that Jesse Jackson. And he calls it Set Lusting Bruce. And he mostly talks about Bruce Springsteen and all of that. But... And he brings Bruce into every episode, but he also does interviews. And we talked about kind of just, you know, me and music in general and some other things. And, I, and he was talking about the decline of the album because I was describing Rex's new upcoming album and how I'm crafting it. And I said to him, I agree, but there are artists that are now considering the album as an art form again, which I think is, is awesome. And we'll see if that trickles down to the majority of artists at some point to where you start to get maybe... Uh, streaming services, being more considerate, taking more consideration in creating playlists that are uh, akin to an album as a work of art or, or marketing things like that. We'll, we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll see where that goes. And I'm very interested to see where it goes because I do think things will change. Uh, you know, like rock and roll, everyone in every generation says it's dead. People said rock was dead in like 1960, you know, and then again in every single decade. People have been saying that about the album and, and so many other things in music, again, in probably almost every decade, maybe not the 60s and 70s, but certainly in every other decade beyond that. And, and so I dismissed the fact that the album is dead, and I and I don't necessarily agree with that. And the other reason I'm starting in the 50s is because music prior to that era has not really influenced me as much, and I like to always bring it around to why I'm talking about this on a personal level. And I know less about it. I do know some about it, because my dad knows a lot about it. I grew up listening to him not just sing the songs from the early part of the 20th century, but also talk about where they came from and all of that. So there's a certain level of knowledge that I guess has influenced me, but the music itself only just a little bit. That's kind of also true for the fifties, but I'll get there and I'll talk about where that goes when I finish going through that decade. But let's start here with 1948 and 1949 and discuss some notable and favorite albums from the, from those two years. Again, when the 33 and a third really took hold as a commodity, as a commercial commodity, the first Christmas album that I have been able to research and find information on was actually in 1942. Bing Crosby, who back then is 78 RPM, four discs, eight songs. So again, I'll pick this up. And for those of you just listening, I'm just picking up the photo album. Imagine this filled with four 78s, eight songs, and they were all Christmas albums. And when you look at the listing of uh, Bing Crosby's Christmas album, the 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 first modern day Christmas album, maybe the first Christmas album ever, and the first of many for Bing Crosby himself. You're going to see a lot of very very. All, I think all of the songs are familiar and all have been redone thousands of times, and it just shows how Christmas music has been around. You know, for not forever, no, but at least since certainly the 19th century. And on the on record, 
probably from the very beginning. And as far as a collection, an album, we say 1942. And it shows also that artists who were popular doing other things always eventually get around to doing Christmas album. And I swear I'm going to do one one day. I was thinking about it this year, but I just don't know if I can fit it. But one of these years very soon, I'm going to do a Christmas album. But if we're talking about the modern era of albums, then we're starting in 1948. Frank Sinatra released the album Christmas Songs by Sinatra, which again, eight songs, because it was a co-release on four disc a set of 78 RPMs and a 10-inch LP. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, 10-inch LPs were the standard. 12-inch would trickle in in the 50s. This is, I believe, and I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong, I'd love to hear from you, the first 33 and a third Christmas album, Christmas Songs by Sinatra. But tell me if I'm wrong. Speaking of Christmas, even though this is not a Christmas album, you will maybe know the name of uh, this notable artist who released a notable album in 1949, and that's Burl Ives. And he's someone who's been associated with Christmas music since at least the 60s and probably the 50s. Uh, he released an album called The Return of the Wayfaring Stranger, and he was always a, already a big star by then. And again, released it concurrently as a four-disc, 78 RPM set, but nine songs, because two of them were short enough to fit on one side, and one 10-inch, 33 and a third LP. And I always like Burl Lives. He's actually a very compelling person as an artist, not just as a musician, where he has that kind of folksy approach to things, but very compelling voice. Uh, but also as an actor, and you find that he could go whimsical straight up to scary as an actor. And he's somebody somebody to look into if you're interested in uh, lesser-known actors uh, whose work you don't know. Uh, and this is also significant because he was doing folk music, basically, you know? And folk music would slowly grow in popularity in the 50s, uh, especially to the point where in the 60s it was huge, and, and it was even huge in the late 50s and morphed into folk rock and all that, and folk pop, really. So I found that to be notable. But let's start with the 50s now. Here we are with the, the decade mentioned in the title of this freaking episode. 1950. Uh, again, a lot of these are notable as opposed to favorite, partly because even though some of these artists I absolutely love, I don't necessarily know these albums as albums. And again may not have had a huge influence on the work that I do, although in some cases, the non-recorded work I do, some of the covers that I sing and all of that, then there is there has been an influence and that's trickled through, you know, from them through my dad and to me. 1950, Ella Fitzgerald releases an album called Ella Sings Gershwin. Uh, it was her first album on 10-inch vinyl. She did put out 78s prior to that. There were, so then there were eight tracks, eight songs. And you'll find that the early 50s were, A, dominated by uh, jazz and, and jazz-styled vocalists. And, and B, those artists were predominantly Ella, Bing Crosby, Doris Day, Dinah Shore, Frank Sinatra, Joe Stafford, Frankie Lane, a few others. But then you and and and, uh, and Nat King Cole predominantly as an instrumentalist at the time, although he would trickle up to being a more well known as a vocalist. Burl Ives incessantly releasing things in the early fifties. Eddie Fisher releasing you know a lot then and a very popular person. So again, uh, ubiquitous. And then the Ames Brothers. And I want to mention the Ames Brothers because vocal groups, multi vocal groups were a huge thing in the 40s even. You know, you think Boogie Woogie Boogie Boogie Company B or something like that. You know, female and male, you know, uh, you know, vocal groups like the Barbershop Quartet feel, but with a jazz, you know, swing or whatever, or even folk based and, and then eventually kind of soul based or R&B based. And we, you know, vocal groups exist to this day. You know, if you think about uh, uh, pentatonics, you know, or take five or take six. I can't remember. Yikes. And uh, I think it's take six. And so many of the other groups, even the boy bands, but a lot of that started certainly probably before recorded music, but it is documented through the era of recorded music and is was just huge in the 50s uh, if we're talking about uh, the modern era of albums. 
1952, uh, Billie Holiday released an album called Billie Holiday Sings. And that was her first 10 inch. She, again, did 78s, but that was her first 10 inch. And again, eight tracks because 10 inch. And I'm just, I'm fascinated by that because that's something that, okay, was probably cheaper for record companies to manufacture 10 inch discs as opposed to 12 inch discs. So it made it easier. But, and it was also, well, we we're already doing that on 78s. So why expand it until 78s began to be phased out to the point where they were like, well, now we can fit more on a 12 inch. So probably charge more. And then also, you know, be able, that became the standard. That became the standard. Uh, in 1952 also was released uh, an album called Bird and Diz by Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Again, eight tracks. And again, co-released on the, the stack of 78s. I think that's a notable album. Uh, 1953, New Concepts of Artistry in Rhythm by Stan Kenton. Again, co-released single 33 and a third 10 inch and the you know 78 rpm stack eight tracks it you're you're seeing a pattern here which is by the early to mid 50s jazz was one of if not the dominant force in commercial music not just music but commercial music jazz is alive and well today regardless of what some people might say and has been ever since but as far as it being popular, I think when I did my decade slam and said, you know, when did each of these things had their heyday in the 50s, jazz, absolutely incredible. And I, I like a lot of the jazz from the prior to that and also from the 60s and even through the 70s. But that was commercially when it was the most popular, the most viable. So you have people like Miles Davis, Again, Billy Holiday, Dinah Washington, one of my favorites, Oscar Peterson, Art Blakey, Louis Armstrong, putting out album after album and, and more. And I'll mention more as we get later in the decade. But also by this point in the, in the 1950s, again, you had a lot of vocal groups putting out the Ames Brothers. I mentioned the Mills Brothers. And you could probably mention, if you know anything about that, more vocal groups, vocal groups, vocal groups. In a few weeks, I'm going to be doing an interview, which is also going to be a book talk about uh, with a guy who wrote a history of the Mamas and the Papas. And in that book, he talks about how John Phillips was uh, hugely influenced by vocal groups like this. And a lot of his early work pre-Mamas and Papas sounded a lot like that and morphed into a folk version of that and etc. Anyway. And this was the era that he grew up in. So these are the artists that he would have been influenced by. And you'll, you know, a little preview of what's coming in a few episodes. By 1954, is my estimate, the dual release on both 33 and a third single disc and 78 RPM four discs was all but phased out. Again, you would still see some, but it was pretty much not the standard anymore to dual release. And by the end of the decade, you saw almost no 78s and you know, by the end of the 60s, people they probably didn't even know what they were, you know. Uh, so let's get to 1954. Very notable album and actually a favorite of mine, Songs for Young Lovers. It's the first album that was uh, a collaboration between Frank Sinatra and the arranger Nelson Riddle. And I, again, will contend and I firmly believe that the work that Sinatra did with Nelson Riddle stands as his best work and possibly Nelson Riddle's best work. And this was 1954, and it was the first in a series that they did together, back to back to back. Interestingly, still a 10-inch, because this was still the dominant length, not something you think of. I would need to check, and you can check for me, is the modern version of Songs for Young Lovers, I am going to bet that it was so popular that at some point subsequent to that, it was re-released in the era when 12-inch was dominant, and they added songs to it. That happened a lot. Pretty sure it happened with this too. Uh, 1954, again. And I'm saying this because I saw some conflicting uh, reports online, so I'm not sure what the truth is. Rock with Bill Haley and the Comets. It says online that it was released in either 1954 or 1955, and I can't verify which it was. Please, if you know, please tell me. Either way... These are recordings that were done, hold for drum roll, 1952 to 1953. 
Now, anybody who knows or thinks they know the history of rock and roll would mark in the area of 55, 56 is when rock and roll started. Now, I've mentioned before, and I did a whole episode on this, things that got their name, rock and roll got its name around that time, existed before it was named. And so what we think of as the start of something is probably not the start of something, right? Uh, there, there are songs from the 40s, and there's even a couple of songs in the 30s that are that sound so much like rock and roll that you may have well may well just say that that's when it started, not as a phenomena, but as music. But for sure in the 50s, and the fact that Bill Haley was one of the early, you know, the main influences on what became rock and roll recorded this stuff in the early 50s, which would, of course would mean that they started before that because artists rarely jump in and record first thing out. They're, they're performing, they're writing, etc. before they even get into a studio. Just proves that rock and roll has existed long before we think it started. And what's interesting there, and to put it into the middle of the decade, is that it was followed immediately by two seminal albums, Shake, Rattle, and Roll, and Rock Around the Clock in 1955. And I believe Rock with Billy on the Commas was the, was it the soundtrack to Blackboard Jungle? I'm not sure. I believe I read that, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. I love being corrected because that means you're paying attention. And even though jazz and vocal groups and, 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 and jazz soloists and, you know, jazz styled people would continue to sell big and folk music would continue to sell big or popular folk music, let's say, the sands were shifting by the middle of the decade, you're going to get a lot more rock and roll and you're going to see me jump into that very soon, but not yet because this is 1955. And even though, again, Rock and roll existed, albums were released, singles in particular were released, and a lot of early rock and roll artists did not release full albums. Later on, they might have been compiled into such, but because, you know, maybe the record company who was doing rock and roll was experimenting with and didn't have a lot of money or didn't want to put a lot of money into it, they would just release singles, you know, it's the 45s, usually a song on each side, and that's it. And then later on, albums became more of a consideration in rock. But at this point, Rock was still certainly not dominant. So you have, in 1955, the debut album from Tony Bennett, Cloud 7. I don't know the album. I love the name. I'd like to know why it's called that. I can't do all this research. You guys, patreon.com slash music is not a genre. And I would be able to tell you, I'd be able to do a five-minute riff on Cloud 7 by Tony Bennett. But the fact that that's, he's one of my favorites and that's his first album, love that. You also had lots of uh, uh, other uh, jazz vocally type artists releasing stuff in the middle of the decade. Dean Martin, Rosemary Clooney, Sammy Davis Jr. would all debut their work around this time, debut albums around this time, all as well as Sarah Vaughn, Thelonious Monk, Mel Torme. I mean, they've been around a little longer, but then as far as debuting, uh, you know, an actual 33 and a third album, boom, the 50s, mid 50s. Uh, Blue Moods, Miles Davis, 1955, not his first recording, but uh, I, I would consider that to be somewhat seminal. More Frank Sinatra with Nelson Real, as I mentioned. Joe Stafford was still going strong at this point. And uh, there was an insane number, as, as we say, in 55 and trickling into later in the decade, of seminal, just seminal rock and roll and doo-wop singles, starting really in 1955. As it became a thing and teens got into it and it was marketable, more record companies released this stuff. There was also a huge explosion in the number of albums in general in 55. What, you know, and, and I think at that point is when the 12-inch started to take over as well. But again, if I'm missing something, please let me know. Uh, another seminal album in that year, uh, not a rock and roll or jazz, soundtrack to Oklahoma, to the film version of Oklahoma, the movie musical, 1955. Um, songs from musicals had been on record for certainly probably decades before that, but not necessarily from film musicals uh, in, in to this degree. So pretty important. 1956, debut album by Gene Vincent, Blue Jean Bop. That's super important. 1956, 
Calypso by Harry Belafonte uh, was the first album in history to sell over a million copies. When you consider how much smaller the population was at the time, the fact that he sold a million copies of that album just shows how popular he was, how much people love that music and what a great artist he was. Also, 1956 marked the first full full album collaboration between Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong. They had done work prior to that, but this was the first time they put a full album together of their collaboration. It's also the year that the Platters, doo-wop, rock and roll, debuted their first full album. And then I also noted here in 56 an album called Dinner Music for People Who Aren't Very Hungry by uh, Spike Jones. And what's significant about this is I'm going to be talking a little bit more in a couple of years, you know, down the line here uh, about comedy albums. And if you hear the name Spike Jones, it's sort of like hearing the name Steve McQueen in that there's now another Spike Jones that we think of first. The director, the, the, the film director, the uh, mu- m- mu- uh, music video director, the way we think of Steve McQueen, the director who's doing great work now, before we might think of Steve McQueen, the actor, and there are two different people, you know. Uh, But Spike Jones, somebody I always liked as a kid because it showed that music and comedy could go together as as opposed to musical comedy, a whole different thing. Uh, Also, 1956, the eponymous debut album from Elvis, which if you think of that cover in your head, The Clash for London Calling did a takeoff of that. A few other bands have done a takeoff of that. It was just a a really great graphic design. And I mean, it's Elvis. It's 1956. It's the debut album. Again, still a ton of jazz albums happening. Still a ton. Also folk and country. And also orchestral and easy listening. A lot of that. It's when things, and to me, I think what happened was you had the big boom of bands you know, like orchestral bands, jazz bands, you know, um, Duke Ellington and Glenn Miller and and uh, Artie Shaw and all of those in the 30s and 40s in particular. And as that started to decline, it would morph into, you know, Montavani and Esquivel and things like kind of like a lounge music, orchestral music with maybe some light vocals here and there that was easy listening. That's really when I did the uh, episode on easy listening, I kind of started there, you know. Uh, going to 1957, Coltrane, John Coltrane's debut album, Ray Charles, eponymous debut album, After School Session, Chuck Berry's debut album, Here's Little Richard, debut album, With His Hot and Blue Guitar, Johnny Cash's debut album, The Chirping Crickets, Buddy Holly and the Crickets, debut album, Ricky, Ricky Nelson's debut album, which was... In a way, the debut, although not fully, because you, you know, Pat Boone and stuff, of like rock and roll light, of pop music that would take off from rock and roll, in the same way that, that jazz vocalists would take off from more, you know, like a serious jazz or traditional jazz. People like Ricky Nelson and eventually Frankie Avalon and Fabian and Bobby Rydell, actually friends of my dad when he was a kid, uh, would do that kind of rock and roll light. But... It's also notable because this Ricky album was the first album by an artist under 18 to reach the number one spot. So it just showed how much teens were dominating the scene at the time. And this is also still very much in the era of artists releasing multiple albums per year. You know, when I do the Beatles series, I'm always just mind blown by how many albums they released in such a short period. But that was because the tradition was to release minimum two albums per year, you know which is what they did through most of their career. And that was happening with Sinatra. It was happening with all, really all of these artists, almost all. Uh, Then we get to 1958, Bo Diddley, the eponymous debut album. That's huge. Bobby Darin, eponymous debut album. The Everly Brothers, eponymous debut album. Jerry Lee Lewis, eponymous debut album. The Kingston Trio, talk about folk, folk vocal groups, eponymous debut album. Sam Cooke, eponymous debut album. I mean, what a huge era. This is insane. Now, we also had an album in 1958 that I find super fascinating. And I looked this up because it was on a list and I did some research on various websites. I, you know, I do do Wikipedia, but I do a bunch of other websites to kind of cross-reference. 
And it is by a comedian, a stand-up comic named Mort Saul. And the album was called The Future Lies Ahead. And a lot of people who follow comedy albums kind of mark this as the first modern day comedy album. And I, and I, and I, and as far as especially 33 and a third and all that, but they also mean modern day regarding the type of comedy that it's stand up comedy and, and not Valvillian or whatever. But I needed to know for sure, was this the first, you know, comedy recording or comedy album ever? And the answer there is no, not only that comedy recordings date pretty much as far back as sound recording in general there was there is a recording that is that still exists i think somewhere of somebody doing a co comedic monologue or story on record or probably cylinder in 1898 so this was by far not the first comedy recording but it was the first i believe 33 and a third comedy album also that year showed the first comedy album by mike nichols and elaine may and if you don't know who they are look them up you need to it was called Improvisations to Music. And we get to 1959. And uh, Joao Gilberto, you know, of Bossa Nova fame, Chega de Saudade, I hope that I'm pronouncing that relatively correct. Uh, I, I don't know if that was uh, his debut album, but I just thought that was significant. Uh, Cliff, which was Cliff Richard's debut album in 1959. Richie Valens' eponymous debut album. Uh, the debut of the Chipmunks, Alvin Simon Theodore, Let's All Sing with the Chipmunks, 1959. Yeah, that's how long they've been around. Also in 1959, one of my favorites from one of my favorite artists, Time Out by Dave Brubeck. Don't even get me started, because at some point I will start. And the Isley Brothers debut album, Shout. The album called Sings, which was Conway Twitty's debut album. And there were also a ton of blues albums this year and through the decade, and that would increase. And blues has been around again since, you know, the advent of the blues slash, you know, early recorded music. And you get a lot of blues artists and a lot of, you need to look into early blues recordings and how uncensored they were, especially in the 1920s and 30s, up to the mid 30s at least. And just in general, the variety of blues that existed. And yeah, we have to make a note of the fact that those artists probably didn't get much, much of the money, if any. But the fact that it was being recorded meant that somebody loved it, you know, and somebody was buying it. And so Willie Dixon's debut in 1959, Willie's Blues, uh, to me is significant. Muddy Waters was, was also recording a lot at this time. And that really takes us to the end of the 50s and getting close to the end of this episode. Stick, you know, uh, stay with me. I'm not quite done yet. A couple of things to go here. One is, what are the conclusions that I have here? Well, I mentioned a lot of them as far as what were the do was the dominant music of the era and how that morphed through the decade of the 50s, you know, from jazz and vocalists and and multi you know multi-part vocalists and all of that and the folk and then eventually rock and roll and all and, and blues and all of that stuff but also how the uh technology morphed from dual release 78s and 10 inches to uh, single release 10 inches to just 12 inches and i'm not mentioning 45s here because this is not a series about singles or 45s it's about albums but they existed in huge force as well at the time uh, 45 RPM. Not n Now, the other conclusions, and this is more on a personal level, again, none of these albums have been direct influences on me, but there are lots of indirect influences. Artists of this era who influenced other artists in later eras who influenced me. For example, if you talk about the Everly Brothers and Buddy Holly and Little Richard, all of whom significantly influenced the Beatles and others. Chuck Berry, of course, who influenced everybody, as as the rest of them did. Bill Haley, just simply because rock and roll. Uh, and even Elvis, to a degree. And even Sinatra, in a way. And I mentioned this in one of my catch-up episodes, how my dad reminded me that one of the things that was just revolutionary with Sinatra is that he spoke, he, he sang in a, in a speaking sort of way. He wasn't declaiming. He was singing things like he was having a conversation with you. And I think any artist subsequent to Sinatra who sings that way uh, owes a debt to that stylistically. 
So I certainly do because I sing that way sometimes. It's also significant this decade because in the beginning of the decade and prior, I don't think anybody really considered the album as a work of art by the end of the decade and, and largely influenced by people like Nelson Riddle and Sinatra and uh, Woody Guthrie even. Uh, the album was being considered as a work of art in its own right. Again, and I, I will keep repeating this, as opposed to just a collection of songs or singles. So a very, very significant decade for the development of the album, if not for the album itself, if, if you get my meaning there. Which brings me to one of my favorite parts of every episode, and that is the featured song. And this featured song... Again, because I don't get a lot of influence from this music, it's it's a weird one and it's purposely weird, but I think it's appropriate too. And it's a song called Classical Space Jazz One off of this album right here. For those of you just listening, I'm showing it to you. You can look it up. It's Long Held Grudges by The Drop. It's the artist's name I go under when I'm recording instrumental music, certain types of covers, music for film and, and uh, you know, sync sync music and look that up as well I did, i've done some episodes on that and this is and i, I could be wrong because i forget now and i never noted it i believe i took a public domain recording of bach and if it's not bach you can tell me and added jazzy elements i added a this a great jazz drums to it and bass and a keyboard with a melody and some weird sounds that make it space jazz in sort of an Esquivel kind of way, but not quite that that weird and and quirky elements. It was for a comedy film and it needed to be both kind of slick and smooth, but also weird. And that's kind of where I went with that. And again, it's off the, it's classical space jazz one. It's off the album Long Held Grudges, which up until recently was only available at recarea.bandcamp.com. And that's the link for this song. But below that, I have a link to the main page for this album, which can send you to any streaming, major streaming service that you want. Spotify and Apple and YouTube and Amazon and all that stuff. Because I just recently released this worldwide. And I'd love for you to check it out. And I'd love for you to dive into this song, as always. Uh, So, as far as this episode goes, are you a fan of albums? Uh, do they do they play any significant role in your music experience, music listening experience, music history? Or you, do you prefer to just listen to single songs or create playlists from songs or somebody else's playlist you listen to and the album doesn't really mean much to you? If it does, does music hit you differently when it's absorbed in album form as opposed to singles? There are songs that on their own, they're fine, but when you listen to them in context you understand them so much better. And I'm going to say this because it's it's important to me. Rex's new album is like that in many ways. There are songs that are going to be standalone singles easily, but they fit into the whole, into the picture of the album that comes along with other songs that work best as part of that whole album experience. And that's how I would prefer... I don't, I don't care. Listen to it however you want, but I think trying to listen to it both ways is a wonderful way to do it. I like to pick singles, but then I also like to sit down or drive or whatever and listen to a full album. And it there is a there is actually a huge difference. You know, it requires a longer attention span, a longer kind of you know listening comprehension, but it pays off well. Uh, do you have any favorite albums from the 1950s or or pre-album uh, album favorites from the collected 78 RPM era, 40s and 30s or whatever? You may know more about that than I do. And I'd love to hear all of your opinions on this and your favorites and things like that, because as always, my objectives here are music, conversation and connection. Thank you for hanging with me just long enough to my voice for my voice to almost give out. And I will talk to you next week.